بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. إن شاء الله continuing with our study of the life of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. السيرة النبوية, the prophetic biography. In the previous sessions, we were talking about the Battle of Hunayn, which was after the conquest of Mecca, and then subsequently the siege of the city of Ta'if, also known as Ghazwat al-Ta'if, or the Battle for Ta'if. So we talked about the, those particular events and how it concluded and how the Prophet ﷺ made the very wise and strategic decision, uh, of course by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to not further pursue the fall of Ta'if, but the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba left there. And we talked about the aftermath of that, that that would eventually lead to the people of Ta'if the following year coming to the Prophet ﷺ and accepting Islam and making peace with the Muslims. <clears throat> now on the return back from the Battle of Hunayn and the Battle of Ta'if, the Siege of Ta'if, the Muslims were able to collect quite a bit of spoils of war. Now, the spoils of war, which a lot of times is also known, or maybe you've heard the term war booty, it'll be referred to, or the spoils of war, the, the goods, the materials, the weaponry, the armory that is seized in the aftermath of a victory uh, in a battle, that basically refers to the spoils of war. The word for this in the Arabic language is al-ghanima, malul ghanima, or al-ghanaim. There's another word for it as well that the Qur'an uses, and that is the word anfal. Nafal or al-anfal, anfal. That also refers to the spoils of war. There's one other word that the Qur'an uses, and that's called al-fay, malul fay. However, those are not just normal spoils of war. Wealth or material that is recovered in the aftermath of an actual battle, where conflict actually occurs, a battle is engaged, that is called ghanima. But when there is a peaceful surrender and some things are collected at that time, that is called malul fay. So this is basically going to be about this particular issue. The spoils of war, malul ghanima or al-anfal. And that is the name of the surah which talks about the battle of Hunayn. It ends up talking about, well actually Surah Al-Anfal, excuse me, I'd like to correct myself. Surah Al-Anfal actually speaks about uh, the Battle of Badr. We had spoken about this previously. But nevertheless, Al-Anfal or Ghanima, that is what the spoils of war are called. That's what they're referred to as. Now what happens at this particular time <clears throat> is that there's a lot of the spoils of war that have been recovered in the aftermath of the Battle of Hunayn and the Siege of Ta'if. The Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims are returning back to Mecca. At this particular time, because when they first came to Mecca for the conquest of Mecca, they did not perform Umrah. They did not perform Umrah. Why? Because they came under the pretext of the potential for conflict. So they were not in Ihram, because they were coming to basically seize the city of Mecca. And conflict was a possibility. A battle was a possibility. So they were not in ihram. They did not come with the intention of umrah. Because there was some possible hostility. However, now that Mecca was fully secure and under Muslim control, and they were returning back to Mecca now, the Prophet ﷺ made, it gave the instruction and made it known to the companions that as they proceeded back towards the city of Mecca, they would be donning the ihram, they would be entering into the state of ihram, and they would be performing umrah at this time. And this would be known as the third umrah of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ performed four umrahs in his lifetime. The first was not, they never actually performed the Umrah itself. They put on the Ihram, but they were stopped at the place of Hudaybiyah. But Allah gave them the reward of the Umrah, because why? They were blocked, they were stopped. It was not of their own choice or their own accord. Second time was the following year, which is known as Umratul Qada. When they came back a year later under the Treaty of Hudaybiyah to make up for the previous year's Umrah. And this would be the third. And this is known as the Umrah of Ji'irrana. Umratul Ji'irrana. Al Ji'irrana is the name of the place <coughs> which serves as the Miqat. The place from where you must enter the state of Ihram when you are coming from the side of a Ta'if. Okay, so they have all the spoils of war and they're going back to Mecca 
and they want to perform Umrah and enter into a state of ihram before they proceed any further. The Prophet ﷺ said, before we can go into ihram, so that then we can perform Umrah with zero distractions, no other focuses, nothing else on our minds, the Prophet ﷺ said, we must distribute all these spoils of war. We have to offload all of this. And there's something that I had mentioned previously after the Battle of Badr, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم يَكْرَهُ النَّفْلَ الْأَنْفَالِ the, the most, one of the things that the Prophet ﷺ had to do, that was a part of his responsibility. But one of the things that he disliked doing the most was distributing the spoils of war. Not because, well, ayadu billah, God forbid, the Prophet ﷺ did not want to do his job. Of course not. But the reason why the Prophet ﷺ had such disdain and dislike for the distribution of the spoils of war was because he said it's money, it's wealth, it's material, it's material things. And it distracts people. It distracts people. It's a test, it's a trial. Right? It messes with people's intentions. It clouds people's judgment. Money has a propensity to do that. And we've talked about it previously that in the aftermath of one of the battles, I believe it was Khaybar, that there were some amongst the Muslims, just a couple of people who had taken something that was not rightfully theirs, and the Prophet ﷺ so severely admonished them. And told them to return it back. One man who had a shawl, the Prophet ﷺ said, this is a shawl made out of fire for you. For you, this would have been a shawl made of fire. So it just, it, it, it's a distraction. And it, like I said, it clouds people's judgment, messes with their intentions. So the Prophet ﷺ did not like it at all. He was not fond of it at all. But nevertheless, this was something that had to be done. So at this particular time, the Prophet ﷺ decided to basically distribute these spoils of war. Now, <clears throat> quoting again, going back to Surah Al-Anfal, over there Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says something. He says, وَعْلَمُوا uh, The Prophet ﷺ says, أَنَّ لِلَّهِ خُمُسَهُ وَلِلْرَسُولِ وَلِذِ الْقُرْبَى وَالْيَتَامَى وَالْمَسَاكِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an says, أَنَّ لِلَّهِ خُمُسَهُ That a fifth of the spoils of war, one-fifth, 20% of the spoils of war, are at the discretion. They automatically are set aside and are at the discretionary usage of Allah and His Messenger wasallam. And they are there to serve the communal needs. Like the family of the Prophet wasallam. their allowances and their, you know, basically sustenance will come from there. Similarly, the... You know, any type of, um, you know, community, uh, work that needs, any social services that need to be provided. Like taking care of the orphans, taking care of widows, looking after, you know, homeless folks or folks that might be struggling financially. All of that would come from that one fifth, that 20%. And then the other four fifths would be distributed amongst those who had participated in the war. Alright, in the battle. And the reason for that was because sometimes that kind of throws us a little bit off because we don't fully understand. And the reason why we don't understand is that because the Muslim army at that time would be a volunteer army. It was not a paid army. It is not like our understanding of the military is today. Where when somebody serves in the military, they get paid for it. And they get benefits. And their family is taken care of. And they have all these lifelong term benefits, etc., etc., Right? Like all these different things that military, people that serve in the military are provided, that was not the case. It was a purely volunteer service. If you went, you were going of your own accord. You were spending your own money. You were taking your own supplies. You were taking your own horse. You were taking your own camel. And whatever losses were incurred, were incurred by you. So the distribution of the spoils of war amongst those who fought... The four-fifths, the 80% being distributed amongst them was to help compensate them for maybe any losses they might have incurred, any injuries that they might have suffered, the animal, the, if they brought their own transportation, their own animal, maybe the horse was killed in the battlefield, so to compensate for that, plus all the lost wages and the, all the lost opportunities that they left behind. Because sometimes they'd be gone for months at a time. Right? When they came for the conquest of Mecca, they stayed in Mecca for 20 days. Then they went for the battle of Hunayn, which was just a couple of days, but then they laid siege to the city of Ta'if for another 20 days. 
So by the time they made it back to Mecca, made it back to Medina, it took a week to get to Mecca. Then it would, then they would go back, perform the Umrah for a few days and head back to Medina. It'd take a week to get back to Medina. You do all that math and what you realize is that they were gone for over two months. Now who's paying the bills? Who's running the shop? Who's tending to the fields? Right, so there were all these different factors that were involved and that's why it's very logical, very reasonable, very understandable that they would be given a portion of the spoils of war and it would be very humble what would be given. It wasn't a lot. So nevertheless, one-fifth of the spoils of war is at the discretion of the Prophet ﷺ. For him to use however, and after the Prophet ﷺ, the understanding is it's at the discretion of the state. This basically goes into the state fund. Whatever the state needs it for. Like I talked about social services and other things like that. So the Prophet ﷺ out of that one-fifth, the Prophet ﷺ, there wasn't a lot of need at that time. Like the Prophet ﷺ and his family, they were simple people. They lived very humbly, very simply. They ate once in days. Sometimes they would eat once a day, once every other day. So they're very simple people. So there wasn't a lot of need in that sense. So the Prophet ﷺ made a very strategic decision at that time. He decided to use that portion of the spoils of war that was at his discretion, he decided to use it for a category, for a specific usage, a specific purpose, which is talked about in Surah At-Tawbah. Which is talked about in Surah At-Tawbah. In Surah At-Tawbah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the ayah talks about the categories where zakat is to be distributed. Where zakat is distributed, it talks about those eight Categories: Al Asnaf Al Thamania, Al Asnaf Al Thamania, li Masarif Al Zakat, li Masarif Al Zakat, to distribute the zakat. One of those categories is what Allah refers to as Wal Muallafati Qulubuhum, Wal Muallafati Qulubuhum, which translates as, or I would translate it as, that gifts that are given to bring people closer, gifts that are given to win people over. Okay, so this is not a payoff or a bribe in that sense, but just like a pure, just a gift being given. Somebody who has newly joined the community, somebody who has newly accepted Islam, that showing, giving them some gifts, showing them some love and affection. The Prophet ﷺ said, "Tahado tahabu." He said, "Give gifts, and you will love one another. Your hearts will come together." So. Some gifts would be given to them in order to bring them closer and to really kind of bring them in, uh, you know, welcome them and initiate them into the community to let them know that you are a part of the community. So in Mecca, many of the people of Mecca had accepted Islam, including many of the leaders of the Quraysh, many of the leaders of Mecca had accepted Islam. Now one other thing that I want to point out here that is something, it shows you the foresight and the strategy and the intelligence of the Prophet ﷺ. The issue was that Mecca is hundreds of miles, a couple of hundred miles away from the city of Medina. It's a week's journey away from the city of Medina. Now, Mecca, a lot of Mecca has entered into Islam. Many of the leaders of the Quraysh have entered into Islam. But it's only been a little over a month since they became Muslim. And now the Prophet ﷺ knew that I have to go back to Medina. And the majority of the Medina Muslims are going to go back to Medina with me. And here Mecca sits a week's journey away. I need to make sure that Mecca will be secure. I need to make sure that there won't be some turmoil, there won't be some reversal of the work that we've done here in Mecca. So how do we go about doing that? The Prophet ﷺ said, okay, these people who have accepted Islam purely of their own accord, willingly, لا إكراه في الدين, there's no compulsion, that if, you know, kind of giving them some gifts, you know, treating them like family, bringing them a little bit closer, letting them know that we care about them, we love them, we want good for them, we want to see them succeed, we want to see them do well, this will win us their confidence and then we'll have confidence in their ability to be able to hold the fort down and keep Makkah safe and sound. So the, for this reason the Prophet ﷺ very strategically decided to distribute that one-fifth of the spoils of war amongst the leadership of Makkah. Amongst some of the Makkah leadership. And so the Prophet ﷺ started giving them, calling them up and giving them, you know, different gifts. 
camel, a few camels here, some supplies here, some other things over there, started giving them some gifts. And they were very appreciative. They were blown away. Why are you giving us these gifts? Just because you're our brother now. You're a part of the community now. And we trust you and we love you. And it definitely had the desired effect. But at the same time, something else transpired. Something else happened. And this is narrated in the, in the Sahih of Imam Bukhari, in the Sahih of Imam Muslim, Imam Ahmed has multiple narrations, Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Kathir, Ibn Hisham, multiple historians mention this incident as well, that some of the Ansar, there were some people amongst the Ansar who felt a little, they felt a little, or, or, or they, they, they made some comments. And they felt a little ignored. They felt a, a little neglected. They felt, they were not feeling the love. And some comments were made that gifts are being, he said, they said that when we are in tough times, then we, the Ansar, are called upon. When the situation is tough, when the situation is tight, then we, the Ansar, are called upon. And when gifts are being distributed, then the Meccans, the Quraysh are being called on. Some other comments were that gifts are being given to them and our swords, وَسُيُوفُنَا تَقْتُرُوا مِنَ dima, While our swords are still dripping with blood. Which was an expression to say that we haven't even cleaned off the battle from ourselves and already gifts are being given to those people. So just a couple of people, just a few individuals, some younger, maybe, you know, a brash young men, you know, out of place, out of line, they made some of these comments. The Prophet ﷺ, he heard about this. This news was brought to the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ, he told some of the companions that I need to speak to the Ansar. فَجْمَعُوا لِي الْأَنصَارِ Gather all the Ansar together for me. وَلَا يَدْخُلُوا عَلَيَّ إِلَّا الْأَنصَارِ And nobody but the Ansar should come here. I need to speak exclusively only to the Ansar. Now all the Ansar were gathered together and then the Prophet ﷺ furthermore inquired, he said, is there anyone except for an Ansari here? Everyone said, no, no. They looked around, they said, no, it's just us, it's just the Ansar, the Medinan Muslims. The Prophet ﷺ said, very good. And then the Prophet ﷺ addressed them. فَحَمِدَ اللَّهَ وَأَثْنَى عَلَيْهِ بِمَا هُوَ أَهْلُهُ The Prophet ﷺ started with the praise and the glorification of Allah. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, يَا مَعَشَرَ Ansar." He said, O oh Ansar, O oh community of the Ansar, أَلَمْ آتِكُمْ دُلَّالًا فَهَدَاكُمُ اللَّهُ When I came to you, weren't you lost, wandering about endlessly through life? And God guided you through me? وَعَالَةً فَأَغْنَاكُمُ اللَّهُ And you were destitute, you were poor, you were financially struggling, in debt. And actually living under the burden of usury that was imposed upon them by the Jewish tribes. Was that not the case? And then God gave you self-sufficiency and made me a means of it? وَأَعْدَاءً فَأَلَّفَ اللَّهُ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِكُمْ And you were at each other's throats. Right? Remember the Aus and the Khazraj were fighting one another. You were at each other's throats. فَأَلَّفَ اللَّهُ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِكُمْ God joined between your hearts by bringing me to you. They said, بَلَا يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهُ They said, بَلَا Of course. The Prophet ﷺ then said, أَلَا تُجِيبُنِي يَا مَعَشَ الْأَنصَارِ Don't you have a response to that? It's a very tense conversation. They said, of course, you are correct. But the Prophet ﷺ said, that's not what I'm asking you. أَلَا تُجِيبُنِي يَا مَعَشَ الْأَنصَارِ Don't you have a response, a counter? To me, to what I'm saying, that I did this for you, and I did that for you, and I did this for you. Don't you have a counter or response to that? And they said, وَمَا نَقُولُ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ What do you want us to say, O Messenger of Allah? وَبِمَاذَا نُجِيبُكَ How would we ever counter something you said? Like, 
You're the messenger of Allah, we don't argue with you, we don't debate with you. They said, Al-Mannu lillahi wa li rasulihi. Al-Mannu lillahi wa li rasulihi. The ultimate favor is upon us from Allah and His Messenger. We owe a debt of gratitude to Allah and then to you. Well, why would we ever debate with you, counter what you're saying? The Prophet ﷺ said, أَمَا وَاللَّهِ لَوْ شِئْتُمْ لَقُلْتُمْ فَتَصَدَقَتُمْ وَصُدِّقْتُمْ He said, if you wanted, you could have said the following, and you would have spoken the truth. And I would have attested to the fact that you speak the truth. You could have said, جِئْتَنَا طَرِيدًا فَآوَيْنَاكَ You came to us outcast. The Prophet ﷺ said, you could have said the following to me. You could have said it, if you wanted to, and you'd be speaking the truth. And I would testify that you speak the truth. That you could have said to me, جِئْتَنَا You came to us as an outcast, and we gave you a home. وَعَائِلًا فَآسَيْنَاكَ You came to us with empty-handed, and we provided for you. وَخَائِفًا فَآمَنَّاكَ And you came to us fearful, like basically under threat. When you came to us, you were under attack, under threat. And we gave you safety and security. وَمَخْذُولًا فَنَصَرْنَاكَ You came when, when others had turned their backs on you. And we aided you and helped you. You could have said that. And you'd be speaking the truth. And they said, Almanu Lillahi wa li Rasulihi. They said, No, 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 no. They said, The favor of Allah is upon us, and then your favor, O Messenger of Allah. We would never say that to you. The Prophet ﷺ said, Awajatum fi nufusikum ya mashal ansar. Did you find it a little uncomfortable? Were you a little bothered by the fact that fi lu'a atin min ad dunya? Were you a little bothered by the fact that I distributed some filthy, meaningless, frivolous material things that I distributed amongst the people who had recently accepted Islam to kind of win them over and bring them closer? Were you bothered by that? Were some of you kind of upset about that? وَوَكَلْتُكُمْ إِلَى قَسْ إِلَى مَا قَسَمَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ مِنَ الْإِسْلَامِ And I wasn't worried about you because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the status and the position Allah has given you in Islam. أَفَلَا تَرْضَوْنَا يَا مَعْشِرَ الْأَنصَارِ أَنْ يَذْهَبَ النَّاسُ إِلَى رِحَالِهِمْ بِالشَّاءِ وَالْبَعِيرِ Are you okay with this arrangement? Tell me this, my Ansar, tell me this. Are you okay with this arrangement that people will go back home with goats and sheep and camels and horses? And you will go back home with the Messenger of God? You take me home with you. He said, I swear by Allah, I swear by the one who holds my life in his hands, I swear by Allah. لو أن الناس سلكوا شعبا وسلكت الأنصار شعبا لسلكت شعب الأنصار that if all of humanity walked down a path and the Ansar went down a different path I would go the path of the Ansar if all of humanity went one way and the Ansar went another way I'd go with the Ansar وَلَوْلَ الْهِجْرَةُ لَكُنْتُ إِمْرَأً مِنَ الْأَنصَارِ Had it not been for hijrah, I would have been honored to be considered an Ansari. Had it not been for hijrah, I would have considered myself an Ansari. اللهم ارحم الأنصار وأبناء الأنصار وأبناء أبناء الأنصار Oh Allah, have mercy upon the Ansar. Have mercy upon the children of the Ansar. Have mercy upon the grandchildren of the Ansar. And the narration says, the Sahabi who narrates says, he says, فَبَكَلْ قَوْمُ حَتَّى أَخْضَلُوا لِحَاهُمْ He says, the people started to cry. The Ansar, they cried so much. To the point where there was not a dry eye in the room. People could not stop crying. 
And they spoke up in unison and they said, رَضِيْنَا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ قَسْمًا It is sufficient of a reward, it is sufficient of a distribution for us that we have Allah and in His Messenger on our side. That's all we need. ثُمَّ صَرَفُوا وَتَفَرَّقُوا And that was the conclusion of that meeting and that conversation. <clears throat> and with this conversation, the Prophet ﷺ finished, completed the distribution of the spoils of war, and everyone entered into a state of ihram, and then they proceeded forward to Mecca, Mecca al Mukarramah, to basically perform the Umrah of Ji'irrana. Now, before we conclude for today, there's just two minor incidents I wanted to talk about here today at this particular juncture. Jazakallah khair. At, these partic- at this particular juncture, there's two very powerful, very unique, very powerful, very insightful incidents that occurred. They're very quick in their narration. It won't take a lot of time. Um, but with that, we'll conclude. And then we'll talk about the, how the Prophet ﷺ went into Mecca and then performed the Umrah. But I wanted to mention these two things that transpired out on the way. The first thing was that the Prophet ﷺ passed by um, some of the, uh, a Bedouin man who was a poet. And he started saying, like he was basically saying poetry, and in that poetry he was saying some very crude things and slandering the Prophet ﷺ. Now this is something very, very interesting. It's a powerful lesson. He was saying some very rude, some very crude things and slandering the Prophet ﷺ in some poetry. And he was saying it, standing there out loud, saying it, saying it out loud as they were passing by. And the Prophet wasallam, as they were passing by, the Prophet ﷺ made a comment. He said, اِقْتَعُوا عَنِّي لِسَانَهُ اِقْتَعُوا عَنِّي لِسَانَهُ Which when translated literally, and I want everyone to stay with me, okay? When translated literally, it would translate as, cut his tongue off from me. Cut his tongue off from me. Okay? So, some of the sahaba, فَخَشِيَ بَعْضُ النَّاسِ أَنْ يَكُونَ أَرَادَ الْمُثْلَةَ بِهِ Some sahaba, not completely understanding what the Prophet ﷺ was saying, they feared that the Prophet ﷺ was actually telling them to go and cut his tongue out. And they were kind of perplexed by this because the Prophet ﷺ forbade this type of practice. He said, we do not mutilate people. You don't like, you know... You know, you don't, you don't take their gouge their eyes out and cut their tongue out and all these terrible things that dictators and tyrants and rulers and, you know, barbarians would do. The Prophet ﷺ forbade this. He said, we are not allowed to do these types of things. Not even in war, we're not allowed to do these things. So some were afraid that what is the Prophet ﷺ saying? Like they were perplexed by this. So, but when they asked the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ said, no, 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 no. What I meant was, go and give him some money. وَإِنَّمَا أَرَادَ النَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم He said, go and give him some money. What the Prophet was saying was, make him stop talking about me. And the Prophet understood that these types of people, they were almost like con artists. They were con artists. So what they would do is that they would show up and they would start like reciting poetry against you and start saying rude and crude things about you. And if you paid them something, you gave them some, something, then they would basically go away. So the Prophet ﷺ said, throw him some scraps, give him something, so that he stops barking like a dog, so that he stops all this nonsense. And they just gave him some stuff and he walked away. But the reason why I mention this, the reason why I bring this up is, number one, this shows you the reaction of the Prophet ﷺ to somebody speaking ill about him. So this construct, this very false construct that's been created, that the response to anything ill or anything that is disrespectful being said about the deen, the religion, about the Prophet wasallam, both Muslim, Muslims who have misunderstood and perver- you know, twisted and uh, distorted the religion, a minority, a very vocal, loud, you know, um, belligerent minority of Muslims who have distorted the religion, they try to propose the idea that the response to this is brutality is violence. 
And similarly, there is also a very vocal, loud, obnoxious minority of non-Muslims, Islamophobes and their like, who also try to suggest the same thing, that this is the Islamic response. That when somebody says something untowards or unacceptable about their religion, inappropriate, then they respond with violence. And that can be further from the truth. Here you have a man, the Prophet has an army with him that has 14,000 soldiers in it. And there's one man saying something inappropriate and the Prophet says, throw him a few scraps so that he runs away. Like toss him a bone so that he goes away. Otherwise, how easy could it have been for the Prophet to just finish him? But we see this from the life, from the seerah of the Prophet So that's the first lesson. This is why we need to study our seerah. This is why we need to study the life of the Prophet our history. And number two is, this is also a great example of how mistranslations occur. Because if somebody literally translates it without the context or does not read the narration, they don't understand that the expression that was used in the Arabic language. All right. When we say, get out of my face, what does that mean? Imagine somebody who doesn't know English expressions, idioms and phrases, somebody trying to translate, get out of my face. Makes no sense. أُخْرُجْ عَنْ وَجْهِ مَا مَعْنَهُ Makes no sense. It's not, it sounds nonsensical in Arabic when I translate it. But it basically means, أَعْرِضْ عَنِّي Get away from me. أُبْعُدْ عَنِّي Get away from me. Turn away from me. That's what it means. Get out of my face. So these are just basic expressions. The second thing that I wanted to mention here is a narration from Bukhari. And this is a quite a well-known narration. You might have heard of this before, but it happened at this particular time. That when the Prophet ﷺ was distributing the spoils of war, Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu narrates this, he says, as the spoils of war were being distributed, I was walking with the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ was wearing a shawl. A very common dress of the Prophet ﷺ was that he would tie a lower garment like we do in ihram. Like in izar, a lungi, he would tie a lower garment. And then he would have an upper garment like a shawl and he would drape it around himself, like wrap it around himself like this. So the Prophet ﷺ had a shawl on. وَعَلَيْهِ burdun, najarani, غَلِيذُ الْحَاشِيَةِ And this shawl... The edges, the border of the shawl, like we say, it was hemmed. It was, it had some design, it had some hemming on the end, but because the hemming, the way that it was in, it was very thick at the end. It was very thick. Like almost a coarse material, a very rough material. It was hemmed with a very rough kind of coarse material, so it would protect the edges of the shawl and it wouldn't start to fray. Okay? So that's what the shawl was like. And this was a particular style of shawl that came from Najran. So the Prophet ﷺ was wearing that. There was an Arabi, a Bedouin man who showed up, and he wanted something from the spoils of war. He wanted like a, like some charity, some handout. He wanted something. So instead of asking for it, because they were Arabi, they were Bedouin, so sometimes they were a little bit rough in their mannerisms, instead of saying asking for it, requesting it politely, talking to someone about it, he sees the Prophet ﷺ, recognizes that he must be the man in charge, and what he does is he reaches out for adrakahu arabi and he reaches out for jadabahu jadbatan shadidatan. He reaches out from behind and he grabs a handful of the shawl of the Prophet and yanks it towards himself. And because the shawl was wrapped around and he reached over here on the upper part and then he yanked it, it basically yanked the Prophet backwards by his neck. Like imagine, it's quite violent looking, it's quite severe, like you pull somebody back and they get like whiplash, right? Like pull them back harsh. And he did that. And because the Prophet ﷺ, his skin was very like clear and clean, and the shawl had that rough edge like I told you about. And he pulled so severely that he says, حَتَّى نَظَرْتُ إِلَىٰ صَفْحَةِ عَاتِقِ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ وسلم, وَقَدْ أَثَّرَتْ بِهِ حَاشِيَةُ الرِّدَىٰ مِنْ شِدَّةِ جَذْبَتِهِ he had pulled so severely and then the edge of the shawl was so coarse, was harsh, that because of that, it had pulled and then it had must have like, you know, kind of rubbed. So if it's a harsh, if it's a harsh coarse material, you know, it can kind of like give you like a little bit of like a carpet, like what we call a carpet burn. 
It had done that to the neck of the Prophet ﷺ. And so the, his neck was red, burning red. Like it had hurt him. And Anas says that I saw that. And then some, some of the Sahaba who were there, you know, they kind of freaked out a little bit. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa what's going on here? And he says to the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Mur li, mur. He's like commanding the Prophet ﷺ, Mur li min mali lahi ladhi indak. This wealth that God has given you, tell them to give me some of it. Tell them to give me some of the stuff that God gave you. And everyone's kind of taken aback and the, everyone got quiet, it got very tense. فَالْتَفَتَ إِلَيْهِ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم turned and faced him, فَضَحِكَ And the Prophet smiled. A big old smile. And as soon as everyone saw the Prophet was smiling, his, he was so breathtaking. And his smile was the most beautiful thing you had ever seen in your life. Everyone immediately calmed down. Everyone took a deep breath. Everyone just relaxed and exhaled. And then the Prophet ﷺ pointed to someone who was in charge of the spoils of war. ثُمَّ أَمَرَ لَهُ بِعَطَى And then the Prophet ﷺ said, Can you please give him something. This is the response of the Prophet ﷺ when somebody physically assaults him. And I once again reiterate, and I apologize for the redundancy and the repetition, but I feel this is very important. I reiterate, for those who would propose, for those who would posit the theory and the idea, that the Islamic response to something like this would be violence, indiscriminate violence, and murdering and pillaging and killing. I, it, it, it is very, it's a very worthwhile question. If they have read the life of the Prophet ﷺ, if they actually know what they're talking about. This is a hadith of Bukhari. Highest levels of authenticity. The Ummah has agreed on the authenticity of Bukhari. The chain of narration is there. This is the life of the Prophet ﷺ. This is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. This is the deen that we practice. So inshallah, with that I'd like to conclude here. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the understanding of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to revive this tradition and sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ in our lives and in the world we live in. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all carriers and representatives of this beautiful legacy of the Prophet ﷺ. Subhanallahu bihamdihi, subhanakallahu bihamdik, nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta, nasakhfirka wa natubu ilayk.